Good evening, and warmly welcome to this Think Corner event organized by the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. My name is Hanne Appelqvist, and I'm the director of the Helsinki Collegium. The Helsinki Collegium was founded as an independent institute of the University of Helsinki in 2001 in order to promote high-class research in the humanities and social sciences, and it was modeled after the international concepts of an institute for advanced study. The very first Institute for Advanced Study was founded in Princeton already in 1930. And the foundational principle behind this institute was the idea that researchers selected based on their academic excellence should simply be given space and time to focus on their own curiosity-driven research agendas. And moreover, to do so without any external constraints or direction to produce useful results. The argument offered in favor of this idea was that the most revolutionary innovations not only require decades of committed basic research, but, they, but that they often emerge when least expected. Hence, aiming at knowledge for its own sake without expecting useful results at, as the outcome was seen as, the, as leading to the most useful results in the long run. The question we are facing and addressing today is whether such an ideal is hopelessly old-fashioned. Can we afford, especially in these times of multi-crisis, to let researchers focus on their sometimes strange research interests and trust that in the long run, also the society at large will benefit from their efforts? Alternatively, can we afford not to? If Abraham Flexner, the founding director of the first Institute for Advanced Study, was correct, then academic research essentially depends on the passion and dedication of the researchers themselves. Can we keep that passion alive if too much attention to the outcome is put at the expense of the process itself? So I'm extremely curious to hear what the viewpoints of, our, of today's panelists on these questions are. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Kaisa Kaakinen, our research coordinator, who will introduce the panelists and moderate the discussion. Again, warmly welcome. So. Welcome, dear audience here at Think Corner and also online. Uh, and welcome uh, our esteemed panelists. My name is Kaisa Kaakin and I'm the research coordinator at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, organizing this event. And uh, I would like to mention to the audience that there will be a Q&A after approximately one hour, so you will be able to pose questions. And also there will be a chat for those of you who are following this conversation online, so you can post your question there. But the, uh, let me first introduce our panelists. So Sarah Green is sitting here next to me. She is professor of anthropology at the University of Helsinki, specializing in the anthropology of space, place, borders and location. Recently in her European Research Council advanced grant project called Cross Locations, in which she developed a dynamic and relational understanding of location along with her research team. And currently, she's involved in a joint research with uh, life sciences and social sciences on more than human mobilities. And then uh, we have Marti Koskenniemi, who is academician of science and professor emeritus of international law at the University of Helsinki, and one of the most well-known Finnish scholars internationally, renowned for his critical approach to international law. I'll mention his two recent publications, uh, the book To the Uttermost Parts of the Earth, Legal Imagination and International Power, 1300, from 1300 to 1870, came out in two, um, 2021. And the most recent uh, book, the joint work with Professor David Kennedy from Harvard, uh, titled Of Law and the World, Critical Conversations on Power, History and Political Economy. And then we have uh, Jaakko Lehtinen, who is a tenured associate professor at Aalto University at the Department of Computer Science. 
and also a distinguished research scientist at NVIDIA Research, working on computer graphics, computer vision, and machine learning. And Jakko has also worked uh, before at MIT, and before his research career, he contributed significantly to graphics, the graphics technology behind many hit games by the game developer Remedy Entertainment. So uh, let me continue from where Hanne, Hanne ended. So let us, let's go back to history, to the eve of the Second World War, uh, to the year 1939, when the founding director of the first Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, Abraham Flexner, wrote his famous manifesto titled The Use Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Uh, in this text, he argued for the long-term usefulness of what he provocatively called useless knowledge, academic inquiry motivated solely by curiosity and without much concern for applications. So he claimed, as Hanne also uh, mentioned, that the best way to advance knowledge was to invest in the freedom of the most accomplished and the most promising researchers who should be allowed to focus on their work without external demands of utility. Uh, and he gives examples of uh, uh, like um, impact that has come about uh, that has that's quite central for our life now, like electricity, that it actually was not an intended uh, goal, but it was an unintended byproduct of the work of researchers trying to understand scientific problems. So in Flexionus, we we should trust that the usefulness of research will emerge sooner or later and focus our efforts on fostering curiosity instead. So I would first like to, uh, I, I would be curious to know what you think of this ideal and also maybe a related question, is there space in to the, today's academia for such self-directed and uh, curiosity driven research? So maybe we can start with Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, I first think that this idea that there's um, no need of instrumental justification. I think that the pursuit of knowledge has already ha always had some kind of point to it. Uh, and some of it was, I suppose, in the past to train a person's brain so as to not to what to think, but how to think. Mm. And then for them to go on to use that uh, knowledge in whatever way they wished except for maybe the, the, the STEM subjects. So I, I think that um, that's a large part of not only academic freedom, but also freedom in general, uh, that uh, being educated in, in literally how to think and how to conceptualize is a terribly important part of it. And um, I think you asked about whether there's any role for that kind of thing nowadays, given the emphasis on impact, I think, of course, you know, one of the greatest ways to develop and change um, is to, and to meet the challenges of unpredictabilities, uh, is to inspire people, is to get them to think through new ideas. Uh, and, and whatever they might be about, um, I mean, Academia has created some of its own problems in that respect in the past. Uh, we've tended to understand knowledge in one particular way and, and to disregard or even disrespect some other forms of knowledge in the past. Um, so there's, there's a pluses and minuses to how it's been done in the past. That's not to say there's no room for change, but that I think that underlying idea of being able to give a space for people to get inspired and to inspire others is still very crucial. Okay, so please... Well, I suppose if you ask me the question of usefulness, I'll, ask, I'll answer like any lawyer would by making a distinction. So, mm. so what does usefulness really mean? And one can easily find that there are at least two, two ways to think about that. One is that academics are there to solve problems that other people think that need to be resolved, and when they get to be resolved, that seems to them very useful and everybody goes home very satisfied. 
So I'm not interested in that sort of thing, but I recognize that that exists and that sometimes one does have to do that too. But then there is this other thing which asks the question about, well, why do you think those problems are the problems? And why do you think that those solutions with the methods and the tools you have available would be the right kinds of solutions to those problems? And I think of this as understanding. So academics do not just solve problems, uh, they try to create understanding. Understanding, namely, as to how does problem solving really work? Why do people think these are problems and not those problems? And even if we share the idea that this is the problem, why do we always resolve it in this way instead of that way? And when you think about it in this latter mode, understanding, I mean, then it's really hard to assume that a layperson somewhere outside could measure the usefulness of understanding. And so I'm afraid I'm going to take a very old-fashioned uh, German origin view that this thing called understanding, this really amorphous, hard to grasp, but so important thing of understanding, that it is useful, but that's not the most important thing about it, that that is what academics do, and, and we, of course, receive our salaries from that, we receive uh, our curiosity is being met by going there. But that the great service that understanding has to the world, I don't think there's any better day than today to emphasize the, the importance of understanding. And while I say this, I realize that there are many people out there who would say, oh, that's not a response because it doesn't solve any problem. So, Jakko, you can continue from here. <clears throat> I imagine many in the audience would, would maybe presuppose that I've been um, invited on the panel to offer, you know, the cold calculating technologist's view um, uh, to, to these questions. But I, uh, for those who think that way, uh, I must disappoint you and wholeheartedly agree with, uh, with Sarah and Marti. Um, so I work in an area where applications are abundant. Um, but I would be provocative and say that to demand immediate applications from research is, by and large, there are exceptions, but by and large, it is a surefire way to end up with mediocrity. You know, things that, you know, uh, are not necessarily impactful, nobody really cares, um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's just how it uh, is in my experience of, of two decades of doing research. Uh, to put it in uh, another way, um, if you look at your feet all the time, you're not going to see, and you're in the jungle, if you look at your feet all the time, you're not going to be able to see, you know, okay, there's going to be a passage that's, you know, where I need to go. Um, and, and, you know, one needs to climb up and have somebody look at the, at the broader horizon. Even in these applied areas, I don't think there's any difference uh, in, in this regard. Hmm. So it sounds like you all agree that, uh, with this importance <laughs> of basic research, but, um, and it can m many times be the case that the researchers understand this, but how, how uh, can we uh, convince policymakers, funders, uh, the general society or the taxpayer, that's always uh, often mentioned, of the value of uh, basic research? So um, does it always have to be uh, do you always have to resort to some form of instrumental justification? Um, so do you, do you have, or do, can you somehow explain this uh, long-term, uh, hard-to-measure uh, impact of uh, basic research? And do you have any concrete suggestions, also maybe thinking of today's uh, society and the uh, ways in which we have to... Um, justify our existence as researchers. Do you have any concrete suggestions on how we should articulate, articulate this? So maybe um, we can start with Marti this time. Well, uh, I mean, I'm sure that our experiences are different in communicating with non-scientists or policymakers, etc. My experience has been that well, one has to move between these two levels of operation when speaking with them. I think it's quite justifiable that uh, um, a policymaker, with whom I mostly speak, parliamentarians and ministry personnel and so on, 
so that they justifiably ask that how, do, how does one solve this problem? <laughs> And so you come out with a couple of solutions uh, and you do a little bit of work. You go back to some of the basic materials that you have back home and then you write a memo or whatever it is that you do. But at the at, so I don't think uh, that that should be dismissed or that uh, um, instrumental knowledge in those terms. But in these discussions, often it emerges that the, uh, the, uh, the communication involves an effort to explain where do these problems come from and how in the course of time there have been different kinds of solutions and how we've progressed to this situation. And one is able to impress the interlocutor with the sense that this solution is not just like some colleague who who sits there, but it comes from another source and that the source is in some way important or impressive as it is. Uh, I, so the communication is always, communication with non-scientists is always a little bit different. It always has to do with the cultural context in which one communicates. Um, it's one thing to t speak to American policymakers and another to speak to European and in Europe to speak to German policymakers and to speak to Swedish policymakers. So it's a different thing. I don't think there's a, uh, there is a, a litmus test as to what's the right technique. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop there. Okay. Want to comment? Yeah. Um, uh, one of the questions that I have over this is who thinks that we do have to persuade somebody. Because I mean, in, in past, my past experience, uh, I was living in the UK and was doing research in the UK, and I was asked by the Economic and Social Science Research Council to go visit some small and medium-sized enterprises to get them to say how my research would be of interest to them, uh, how it, that might be useful for them. And so I, 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 it was about new media, and I went to visit some small media companies, and uh, one of the directors of a small media company said, look, sit down. Um, if I want some research done specifically for my company, I will do it. I will employ somebody to do that specific research. I'll get it done in two weeks, and um, then I have to look at my bottom line. How I understand what you do is that you are the kind of person who you work in blue sky research, you work in a university, you ask questions like how many angels can you fit on the head of a pin? And um, you are there to inspire. And, and I could never justify that in my bottom line as a, as a company. So you go do what you do and inspire me with your things and I'll do what I do. And I thank you for doing what you do, but I don't think you can help me directly. So I think what I got from that was that quite a lot of companies do understand that the value of academic work is to, as, as Mati said, to, to gain deeper understanding, but also to inspire, to ask questions that you don't have the time or the resources to ask when you're outside of the academy. Uh, and, and therefore, I think that it would be an interesting question to ask those people who are demanding that of academics, who is that exactly who's demanding that? Is it commerce? Is it really policymakers? Or is there some other agenda? Well, Jaakko, you actually, you one, one foot, <laughs> you have one foot in the uh, IT industry as well, and, and you, of course, uh, collaborate with a lot of people who work there uh, mostly. So w how can you comment on this? Computer science is, uh, uh, is, is special in the sense that it's, it's artifacts sort of um, permeate our lives these days. Um, yet, almost exclusively, the, the, the large paradigm shifting uh, inventions, changes in thinking, um, come from the academia. Here, academia does not mean only universities, but also research labs um, uh, within large companies. We have um, 
illustrious history with, say, the Bell Labs, that's, that's no, now part of Nokia, uh, many Nobel Prize winners uh, employed by there, uh, on the, you know, Nobel Prizes from discoveries um, made during working on things that are of interest to a telephone company. So that, I think, sort of illustrates the fact that it, it, it is oft, uh, often realized, the, the, the value. Um, but it's um, to how to communicate the value, how to convince, say, policymakers about the value. Um, I think it's not often said out aloud that, at, at least in my view, research is it's kind of like a lottery where you don't know when the, when the drawing is. You know, you buy lottery tickets and, you know, uh, it might be that, you know, it never wins. It might be that, you know, there's going to be some payoff in a year or five years. Maybe there's going to be a huge payoff in five years. Maybe there's going to be a huge payoff in a hundred years. But the, the thing is, we don't know uh, when, when we do this um, curiosity-driven blue sky research. Um, and I think the sort of the... The, that nature of blue sky research is not, I, I think, widely, widely understood. I suppose social sciences are a little bit different in the sense that those inventions that may take place happen. Now I'm speaking as a layperson, but I assume that there are still inventions that take pla happen in computer sciences or in the hard sciences. And so you can see, okay, here there was success five years, uh, mediocre success, no success at all. Whereas in social sciences, it's more complex than that. And I was wondering when um, you invited us to this as to how should, I, how should one think of one's impact and one's ability to especially communicate that there's been an impact that, look here, I'm an important, I'm working in an important field, you should be concerned. How does one demonstrate anything of the kind? One works largely in the heads of students and colleagues and try to re-articulate things in ways that they haven't been articulated previously. And, and in, the, in very crude and simplistic terms when, if you ask someone like me, having uh, is now retired, but have, I've always been part of a very large um, social community of, uh, of researchers, a global community of people, then the, for me the most concrete result has been the wide expansion of that community. So whereas for 30 years ago people tended to t think in a very, what I now say as a very limited or narrow or one-sided way about the kind of governance questions that, I'm, uh, that I deal with. Nowadays, they think it in much broader ways and the variety uh, in many, many senses is quite different. But how, how do you... So if I think that as the uh, principal achievement of my field and at least that part of my field in which I have been, so how does one communicate that? Does that sound impressive? May, well, maybe it doesn't sound that impressive. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's no, no single innovation to be pointed at um, w uh, or something that could be instrumentalized in commercial terms. Mm -hmm. none, none of that at all. Nevertheless, I see a huge change and I can also think of as an important um, uh, question of uh, to research as to how this expansion of a wider way to think about issues of global governance, it's a, bit, a little bit boring way to put it, but uh, understandable, I hope, issues of global governance, how has that changed the way we govern the world? Yeah, that's a great example. And I, let me, because before this conversation, we were kind of talking about what is actually impact, because, and Jakob pointed out, of course, you should also think about academic impact. So maybe your example is a good example where you have both academic and social impact, and it's very hard to actually say where, where they lie and how to measure them. Um, do you want to continue? Uh, just a brief, brief comment. Um, not all research in computer science is, uh, is, is application-driven by any means. Uh, theory of computation, for instance, I, I look at it as, uh, you, you know, on uh, the same line as, you know, probing the, the mysteries of the universe and, and uh, how matter is made up and, and, and mathematics. Um, and I do want to tie 
uh, or also get back to what Sarah said in, in her opening uh, uh, remarks, that a really a huge amount of value created by research is in training the minds of the people mm. who do it. That, that I see in, in our field uh, as, as well all the time. How do you approach problems? How do you conceptualize them? How do you, how do you make headway into the unknown? And, and that's, uh, those, those skills are transferable and, and extremely valuable. And that's that I would consider a high impact as well. I mean, related to that, um, I, I think the key impact of, of most university research and education is precisely that, and I, I have had students contact me, ex-students contact me many years later, saying that some lecture course that they went to, that I gave, had actually impacted how they thought about their current job. And... Uh, I think we kind of under-emphasize that that's always been the case, that university research and education has been precisely about uh, giving people the, those mental capacities. But in addition, I've, I've been part of um, impact assessment committees in the past in the UK um, through the research assessment exercise and the research excellence framework. Um, and looking at what my colleagues had done in terms of trying post facto to find some impact of their research was absolutely fascinating. It was brilliant. Uh, many of these things were, uh, findings were entirely convincing. And what it made me realize is that an awful lot of academic researchers hadn't realized until they were asked to answer that question how much impact their research actually had had. Uh, and so it might actually be the wrong person to ask to do impact is the researcher, hmm. uh, or, is have or, somebody else. Or is it a problem that many times you have to answer that before you actually embark on the research? So would that be the problem? Because in I, this example, I, they actually did it after. I think that might actually, the problem with that um, approach is that if you're thinking, I need to do impact, in designing your project, it's going to narrow and constrain how you think about what do I want to know um, if, if it's directed towards a particular intention. Uh, so one of the examples that I read about um, was a colleague in Manchester who had been asked by the Football Association to def who he was a specialist on Latin America and race and racism. And he was asked by the Football Association whether a particular comment made by a Colombian footballer counted as a racist remark. Uh, and uh, he was trying to figure out whether that was impact or not for, for his research. Um, and um, the answer from the university authorities said, well, if the Football Association changed their policies as a result of your advice, then it would count as impact. Otherwise, not. <laughs> <laughs> How does that sound? <laughs> well, uh, so lawyers, I uh, have to say, so we are rarely asked about impact. And if asked, we, are, we rarely produce anything worthwhile. Um, it's not that it's, an, it's a field that's impossible to enter in terms of assessing the effects of regulatory things, for instance. Um, but um, uh, that's usually another type of social science. Criminology is done by quantitative scientists very often, and as, as it also should be to a great extent. So the kind of qualitative legal, critical legal work that, uh, that I do, it's really hard to... Uh, put in those those terms, and, and but, but one is asked every now and then, and then one ends up with those kinds of responses. But has there actually been a change uh, during your career in how much you are asked, like, or, or like, and in in general between this, uh, like, uh, has there been a change uh, in the dynamic between basic research and uh, this kind of more 
uh, impact driven. Can I just uh, answer this directly because I have an excellent example, which is my institute here at Helsinki University. So I came to, to the university in 94 um, and I established, together with colleagues, an institute of international law and human rights. Partly because I wanted to have funds that are separate from the university, general of the faculty funds, etc., that I can manage and manage with friends and operate. Uh, and we got from the government a, a large, largish sum of money for that purpose, because the government thought that it's really useful if we have in Helsinki a hub for human rights, international legal research, because there exists an institution at Obu Academy in Turku, but none in Helsinki. And I thought that was great. I had contacts uh, in the foreign ministry I was able to. And it continued until the government in general, I think in 2005, did a new government research plan when they prohibited external research of that kind. All external research had to be project-related. It had to be six months, 12 months at maximum. Um, and we tried to discuss with, with the government that, well, it doesn't operate like this. Somebody has to, it's a social science institute. We, we have trained lots of people here. We are very grateful for that. They've produced consultant studies for you. They've also produced PhD research. But if you now diminish your, uh, your contribution to our work, to these six month, 12 month uh, studies, then we can no longer continue. Then this will have to be something else. And, uh, and that um, dramatic uh, change in the research financing that took place in Finland took place in other countries, I know through my colleagues, in pretty much the same time, pretty much in, in similar ways. So yes, I think it's very clearly research funding has been oriented, especially when it comes from outside European Research Council or Finnish Academy, etc. such well-established uh, general funders. So the understanding that even that a government in a certain field, let's say environmental field or health and, uh, so, uh, health and security fields, that they could actually um, support basic science, that idea is no longer, well, the idea may be there, but that's no longer possible because of the rules that govern uh, research funding by individual government agencies. What about Sarah and Jakko? In your fields, there are some significant changes in this? Uh, yes, I mean, I think it's been felt, but it's the degree to which it makes a big difference is um, in interesting to think about. I mean... Uh, in our fields, there's been this big talk since the mid-1990s and then much more powerfully through the 2000s about that knowledge economy. And therefore, this knowledge economy, which was coined in some official document in the 94, I think, uh, made it clear that there should be more attention paid to what universities did and that more influence... Uh, of the government in what universities did and the kind of, if we were living in a knowledge economy, then obviously the value was coming out of universities amongst other places most particularly and that therefore attention should be paid to what they were up to. And, you know, corduroy jackets with um, el uh, you know, suede elbows this was no longer the thing. And, and uh, I, I, I think... Um, that did, it, it got felt quite quickly. But one of the problems is that universities are full of academics like me, or, or like all of the rest of us. And so, and we're the ones that are assessing research applications, research projects, and there's always something in one there somewhere that says, what is the impact of your work? What is the social influence of your work? And it, uh, those of us who read those tend to read them as, well, that's quite boilerplate, what they're saying, mm -hmm. and not take it seriously in looking at the rest of the research application, right. but unless you're told you have to give a number, a score to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there's an awful lot going on in terms of... A, a, and there has perhaps always been a tension between governments and universities about what is done with the knowledge that comes out of universities. I mean, there, we've seen many examples where universities have been 
um, the, 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 the location of even revolution in some countries, student uprisings that overturn governments. So getting that relationship between what the universities produce and how much governments try to control it or try to direct it towards one kind of use or another has probably always been there ever since there's been universities. Uh, and I just think the version of it at the moment it seems to center around this phrase, knowledge economy. Maybe, Jako, you can tell us a bit about the dynamic between academic research and uh, more, because you said that there are also the research uh, units in companies. So how does that work? The, uh, I'd like to begin by pointing out that uh, this, uh, uh, as, to, as to your previous question, that uh, it's, it's been going both ways. I think I'm seeing much less of the type of company uh, university collaboration where the aims are not very high and the university is seen maybe as some kind of you know, cheap subcontractor uh, for the company. Uh, the, that kind of work I, I don't see happening uh, basically at all uh, and, that, and that's something maybe it's never been prevalent but at least it's definitely been uh, happening more uh, in Finnish universities in the, in the past. So, so that, that I think is, 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 is great. Um, the, uh, the dynamic and, and the motivations between uh, industrial research labs and, and, uh, and academic uh, institutions are not really that different. So for instance, uh, take my other employer, uh, NVIDIA's research arm. Uh, its explicit mission is, um, or non-mission, is to make products. So it's, it's not an organization that would be solving problems that, um, that the product units have. But it's more um, the, my, my boss's boss, the senior vice president of research, um, uh, uses the analogy of, of the high beams, pitkat, pitkat valot, high beams of a, of a car. Like you want to be seeing things that are, uh, that are far away and you know, get time to react and adapt and, and, and so on. And so there's a, he always tells a story uh, about when NVIDIA Research was founded in uh, roughly two decades ago, um, so, uh, where he, he says that uh, the CEO and founder, uh, Jensen Huang, said, so Bill, let me get this straight. You want to hire lots and lots of smart people to do research that are not directly, um, that do not directly take our products today forward. And then you want to tell the world and our competitors about how we did it. And then says, yes, Jensen, that's right. Um, because that, that is essentially what the organization is doing. We publish everything we do in, in academic forums. And uh, it, it is an academic institution in that sense. Um, at the, of course, there's, there's patenting. That's, that's um, uh, I imagine, clear that that is something that we do as well. Um, but uh, it's really academic work on problems that are or could be of interest to the company. And you know, they, they hire people who, uh, who are interested in those kinds of problems that are or could be of interest to the company. So I don't really see a big difference at all in the way I choose which problems to, to work on in, in, in which, um, you know, at the university or at the, at the company's research arm. But this hopefully comes as some sort of surprise to, to at least some, but this is the case. Hmm. But I, I would uh, be curious to hear more about how do you yourself see what is actually motivating researchers in the work. So uh, you could actually also say, talk about your own experience. How have you uh, yourself uh, kind of, what has driven you in your work uh, and how has the so-called impact or societal impact or some unintended impact? Is it, is it an unintended impact? Have you actually started with certain kinds of goals that you have to, do you want to achieve uh, in, in terms of uh, setting them before uh, your research process? Or is it, uh, can you say that it's more, it's been more the curiosity towards scientific problems or scholarly problems? In my case, I think all the research I have done has been 
um, motivated by intellectual interest and and that probably and I think this is a really important point most researchers work hugely much more hours than they're actually paid for uh, they are motivated by a, a passion for what they're trying to do and um, and, and to a degree, they're also motivated by what it is that is a measure of their excellence as academics. And therefore, uh, you know, if, if the way to get ahead is to have the best kind of peer-reviewed articles and to publish here and there and to impress your colleagues, that's what people are going to do. If you're then told, in addition to that, you must have some kind of impact on something then um, early career academics will do that too. Uh, but that might actually harm <clears throat> the level of passion and motivation mm. you have for doing the work. Uh, and it, it, it just very de much depends on, on how you're doing it, because I think um, maybe that will change. You know, maybe you should have some much, well, we've got a younger colleague here uh, in, in academia, but at the moment, I think what what really gets most researchers up in the morning is their fascination with something, uh, and and uh, to pursue it to its most rigorous and nth degree. Um, in my case, I've occasionally I've worked in almost all my projects in an interdisciplinary way after my PhD, but in in almost all those cases. Uh, even if there's been some practical use for what I was doing, uh, what, what motivated me is sheer curiosity. And uh, I think it would be a sad thing to remove that from, from most researchers. But it, just to add one other thing is that there, there's a tendency in universities now to be very homogeneous across across all the sectors. Homogeneous. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, to standardize what the rules mm. should be, whether it's in the humanities or uh, the physical sciences or the computing sciences or whatever. And they're very different sectors with very different um, dynamics and the tendency to standardize what the rules should be across one as opposed to the other uh, is even on issues of impact or what counts as impact, I think, mm. is maybe needs a little bit of rethinking. Mm. Yeah, maybe I'll let uh, you answer as well, but I, I was also curious of this, precisely this, is there a difference in this dynamic of goal directedness uh, if you compare some sort of societal impact where you want to, let's say, influence a policy, and then uh, where compared to a goal of producing a patent, let's say, or something, something commercializable. Actually, patents are now one indicator also in the social, social sciences and the humanities at the university. So, Martin Jakko can... Well, <laughs> the world is a terribly unjust place. I've always thought that, and even at school. So I became a political person at school, and I thought, what can one do if one thinks that? And then, you know, I graduated, I went to foreign ministry because I wanted to become the secretary general of the UN because I thought, well, that, then I can deal, do, deal with that problem. It didn't turn out that way. Um, I was there in practice 17 years. I've never had a, 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 a normal university career. I was hired as professor uh, from the foreign ministry. Um, and. It's the same task. I was 15, I thought the world is terribly unjust and hard to understand how it's possible that it's so unjust. I still think it's really hard to understand how it's possible, but I try to do my best in order to understand it. So the work is kind of detective work. It's a work which, you, which is motivated by the question, who done it? How did it become this way? out of all the possibilities and alternatives that there could have been. And when I said earlier on, made this distinction between problem solving and understanding, then I come back to that by, by the hypothesis that what we think of as problems are not the real problems. And the way we solve those problems that we think are the real problems, we are not very successful in that either. Um, and that some way, my field, law, 
has organized the world in such a way that all of this is possible, that the crime has, has been committed. And that's it. Um, and uh, with, uh, I brought this book that uh, Kaiser mentioned, with, uh, published last year with my friend and colleague David Kennedy from Harvard, of Law and the World. And so, uh, Critical Conversations on Power, History and Political Economy. So, with, with him and with an expanding group, and I underline expanding group of lawyers and social scientists and international relations scholars, anthropologists, human rights lawyers, we've, we've tried to understand this and we understand it much better now than 25 years ago. There's much better naive faith in the kinds of things in which we uh, believed when we started out by thinking that globalization is great and that we have all these technical tools to manage societies, etc. Our understanding of the complexity of that world is way greater. Now you might say, well, where are the policy proposals? Uh, well, I'm, so I prohibit my students from from writing a policy proposal at the end of their study. I prohibit that in order to get their minds out from the, uh, the pragmatic uh, relationship to the, the world's problems in those terms. And also because I think the materials which with we work always render themselves to different kinds of policy proposals. And so if you end with a policy proposal, then that will appear as stupid as the opposite policy proposal that somebody is going to propose anyway at some point there. <laughs> so do the, do the work for understanding and because that's the preliminary work in order to deal with the injustice of the world. So I, th this has, I don't think there's anything specifically academic about this feeling. With this, in this book, we noticed, we started talking about, well, how, how do you, David, when you, what's your method? And, but my method, and we noticed that we don't have any methods. We are bored with academic debates and discourses over methods. There's an itch. There's an itch. And the itch is about how can, with all these tools, with all this knowledge, with all these structures and this money, how can it be so bad? The, um, I, I think it's a, it's a great luxury to work in a field where um, it's possible to do cur purely curiosity-driven research but on problems that, that also, you know, have, have enough applications that you don't often have to justify uh, uh, what, what, you, what you're doing. Um, but as to the question of goal-orientedness, um, in, in engineering-related disciplines, um, I think it's uh, the, the difference between research and development is often made uh, in that Research is something that can fail, like you're asking a question and you don't know the answer. You don't know if the answer exists. Um, and, and development, uh, on the other hand, is something where, you know, you know, you, you have an idea that bar something completely unforeseen, you're going to be able to, able to get there. And so, I think aiming for direct impact in terms of these kinds of metrics, like, for instance, number of papers, number of, of patents, uh, number of euros earned by licensing your, research, uh, your results or something, that sort of puts the, um, the carriage before the horse in, in, in some way. Because it's, I, I forget who said it, but there's this old, old saying with a lot of wisdom in it that once you, once you take an indicator of success and start optimizing for it, it ceases to be useful as an indicator of success. If that makes sense. Because people start, it starts to change the way people are. Yeah, the, the indicators never capture all the aspects of what impact and success actually means. They, they really should be looked at after the fact. And once you start mm. directly aiming for those things, optimizing for those numbers, then um, the, the quality of the work just tends to, tends to go down. Uh, I am aware of absolutely no, um, no counterexamples to, to this. Hmm. Well, maybe we could then talk about what is excellence? 
because that is something that, uh, for instance, the Helsinki College for Advanced Study Studies always mentions as one of the kind of uh, guiding principles that we want to fund excellent research and researchers. And of course, this is a principle of all institutes for advanced study. But um, so uh, we, of course, have all these uh, um, university rankings that uh, supposedly m somehow measure excellence. But of course, people take them with a grain of salt. Um, but is there a way of uh, somehow determining what is excellent research and how and maybe then uh, the other question how can we promote it if we wish to uh, um, create uh, a context where it can uh, take place sure. um, I think my quick answer to that is no uh, <laughs> but a longer answer uh, that would explain it is whose excellence. Uh, in order to have an idea about what counts as excellence, uh, you have to have a definition of it. Uh, and if you have a definition of it, you have an underlying idea of what's the point uh, of, of how you're going to, to, what you're going to achieve. I mean, I think the example that really taught me that we really have to think carefully about what we're trying to achieve in academic work and how we value it and how we define what is outstanding and what isn't. Uh, was I was the um, editor-in-chief of an anthropology journal for about four years, and um, I decided that I needed to have referees from, at least one or two referees from the country that the article was about who were based in universities there, and who were... Uh, it's actually very difficult to do. Um, in anthropology, of course, you know, there are articles about everything. And quite often, I would get back reviews uh, that were not in the style at all that I expected. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, w w w so what was I to do? Was I to write back to them and say, no, I need you to write this review in this form, because that's what we think a review is, and that's how... Or do I just give that to the, to the person who's written the article and say, well, that's the review you've got? Or do I... Uh, so what I realized was that I had the dilemma of do I try and train people who are outside of the system that I'm in what proper academic knowledge is and how, what excellence counts as? Uh, or do I allow these other voices in and, and at that point, how do I judge? So I'm not saying that I have an answer to this, uh, especially in the sort of increasing debates in my discipline about how you decolonize academia. Uh, but what I'm saying is that there, the, if you, as soon as you start to define what counts as excellence, um, you, can, you can do that and say, okay, we should, we should head for that, that measure. But you have to then openly admit that that is one measure, that it's not a universal measure, and that that's what you've decided collectively that you're going to go for, rather than uh, say there is a measure of what counts as academic excellence. Um, uh, some years ago, I was in a panel judging uh, that would give a prize to young researchers on, on a certain uh, set of legal questions an institutional question. Um, and there was an older uh, professor there, and I asked him, well, but what other criteria were you going to use? And he looked at me surprised, and it was a Frenchman, he said, Mais Marty, il n'y a pas de critères, ce n'est que l'excellence qui compte. Marty, there are no criteria, <laughs> only excellence counts. And I then thought, thought that as outrageous. Uh, and I remember I, I called home saying, I'm not going to sit in this committee, it's so, uh, <laughs> because we need to have... I was thinking then, and I, and I still think that, that criteria are useful for the competitive situation, where there are lots of scholars who are, mm. who are fighting over limited funds, so you have to be able to make these distinctions. Uh, that was many years ago, and now I have more sympathy towards this older French 
um, uh, unfortunately, maybe uh, this older French professor. I understand what he was aiming at. And maybe I, what I want to say is this, that. So I work in the field of qualitative social science and law. It's literature. That's literature. So description and anthropology, too, is, is a long way. Literature. And how do you judge excellence in literature? Well, that's a really complicated question, but it's a real question, and we can talk about that. We can include in that conversation literary persons of various kinds um, and, uh, and regular audience. How does one produce a, a, a persuasive argument about why some aspect of the world is so unjust because of whatever uh, then comes afterwards as the explanation. How, how does one become persuasive in those senses? And, and it's a, it would be really wrong to, to say that, well, you learn by reading more stuff. Uh, the, the people who, who are giving their opinions on the next Finlandia Prize, for instance, they are presumably, they've read a lot of stuff. So we trust their judgment. We don't ask their judgment to be uh, filtered into 10 criteria with, uh, because we don't think one judges literature by re in such a way. Uh, and I would come back to, I think, well, in qualitative social science, um, the, it is like judging the Finlandia Prize uh, very often. I, and I realize when I'm saying this that this is a, a rather elitist uh, attitude towards it, and all kinds of biases can affect and do affect these kinds of choices. Um, and that's an aspect of the injustice of the world. So let's talk about it. Can I, can I just uh, yeah. add to that? Um, an additional thing to say here is about discipline and disciplinarity, that one of the ways of judging excellence is, pres is one of the things that you need to get in learning a discipline is being, being taught how within your discipline something counts as excellent and something doesn't. And of course that is elitist and particularistic and one should openly say so, but it's also very difficult to understand how you would be able to make that judgment without having a very, you know, kind of distinguished set of knowledge that gets passed on and is shared and is built up uh, that counts up as what counts as discipline. And I think that that's a very important aspect of this debate about whether you can have a universal or specific definition of excellence is uh, there is there is a reason why for centuries there have been disciplines and they've changed and they've, you know, new disciplines have budded out of old ones and they've changed and merged and so on but it's a body of knowledge within which you, you can recognize excellence when you see it. And yes, it is elitist, but that, that is one way of moving things forward. Mm. It's, uh, to quote another um, context, uh, I know it when I see it is essentially mm. what, what you're yeah. saying. Um, and that it's, it's such a multifaceted uh, faceted question that um, I don't have much to add to the, to the discussion except that when one evaluates, and you know, there are situations when uh, it needs to be evaluated for, for grants and, and promotions and, and, and these kinds of things. I, I, I think the, the lesson to, um, to keep in mind is just that it can take so many different forms that evaluation by looking at you know, numbers and, and, and you know, a few specific types of, of written down criteria can, can lead to grave injustices and, and you know, overlook, overlooking true excellence where you know, it might, might exist. Maybe I'm looking at the time and before we open the discussion um, to the audience as well, I'd like to ask, because there have been some references to training researchers. So uh, there have been some new initiatives in Finland uh, around doctoral education. Um, so thinking of this, uh, this debate that we have, um, how can we as an academic community ensure that uh, the conditions of research and this kind of uh, maybe self-directed, uh, curiosity-driven research uh, are still there and uh, are kind of endure uh, for future generations? 
what is important in uh, doctoral education and uh, early career uh, mentoring. Yep. Um, I think we in the academia could do a better job in, in conveying the examples of, you know, uh, exactly how this long winding road and, you know, lots of, uh, lots of um, uh, lottery tickets do pay off. Like, what is the mechanism, like, what are examples of this mechanisms, mechanism where it pays off? And what are the examples of mechanism, mechanisms where it doesn't pay off? So, By for the way, instance, can you, do you have an example from your own uh, Research. Um, so I've only done research for for roughly twenty years. So so not by much. But the, the the work I'm most proud of as an intellectual achievement, um, we published in two thousand thirteen. Um, it's not widely cited at at all compared to you know some of the things that we've 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 done afterwards. But I've learned that it some part of that work is now a central concept and, and, and you know, driving um, part of the engine in a related but different um, set of algorithms that have been born out of uh, you know, w w trying to solve the same problems. But so uh, the, the work we did then uh, came up with, uh, with conceptualizations and algorithms for doing something that is useful in a completely well, not completely different, but in, in a way that's completely different than what we th originally thought it would be. We thought it solves a certain problem, but it turns out that when you think about it the right way, it solves a much uh, more general problem, and when you use it in this different way, it actually gets you much further than we ever thought that that original thing would be. And it's been 10 years now, and you know, we're seeing sort of the fruits of that happening, happening today in you know, big strides being made in uh, in, in a certain area of research. Um, I, I'm not going to bore you with, uh, with the details of <laughs> the, the Jacobians of shift, shift mappings in Monte Carlo path tracing algorithms, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's what this is about. Yeah, but we can go to the doctoral education, but... It sounds very yeah. impressive. I wish I had those kinds of words. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, so... Uh, as I said, so I haven't gone through any doctoral training. I just did a PhD um, on side of work, and then they thought that I should be appointed professor. Um, and then, uh, but so what I've found in the course of uh, of research, uh, training my own researchers and being in part of of a research community is the importance of that community. I can't overemphasize that in any way. So that's being key to every innovation, to every step forward that it has t taken place in a community, and a community that, that shares, um, well, the kind of ethos that I was pushing forward, you know what I mean, uh, the, and who think that things like disciplinary boundaries are always part of the problem, that the academic that the administration of academic affairs is part of the problem. And so you complain half of the time and you research half of the time. <laughs> uh, that's the best communities of which I've been a part have always been like that. And the complaining about it is, is a part of making the community f be a real community in which we care about each other's work and we try to help each other and where hierarchies are minimal. You can't avoid hierarchies, but where they are minimal and where they don't extend at all outside the, the, the very substance of the, the research. Um, and I don't have a, uh, an, uh, an algorithm to explain this uh, to you. It's just a, a lived life in which I've been particularly fortunate and, of course, extremely privileged in having witnessed the formation of such, how it then creates other communities, how the internationalism, the ability to, to move between places, how to sympathize between pe with people who don't have the resource funds that, that we have, and so on, how all of that comes together, somehow also supporting the excellence uh, of the thing, because it emerges from being just another job into being, let's do something about this world.
Mm, yes, mm. I mean, I, I agree with quite a lot of that. One thing that I would add to that, though, is just in thinking about the transformations that's going on about doctoral education and research education. These communities are very important, but they've also in the past been quite exclusive. And so that people, uh, I guess speaking as a, a, fe a feminist and as somebody who's in anthropology, mm. I'm interested in um, how different parts of the world have gained access to this kind of community and it's, uh, the way it works. There have been repeated examples of that. So it's, I, I, what I'm saying is I wouldn't want to go back to the old style university before impact arrived because there was quite a lot wrong with it. Um, so it's just that maybe we shouldn't be replacing an imperfect system then with another imperfect system now. Uh, and that uh, I, I, I think that we can look at the advantages of these very privileged communities in which we whine half the time and, and research half the time and being fully aware of those people who've been left out of it and not been included and the voices that weren't in there. And it must be within our capacity to uh, not get rid of, of the good things of those things in the past of, of how knowledge and scholarship was done and leave behind some of the the things that could, we could do live without. And um, one of the things that I think about the current changes that are going on, the controversies, the discussions within Helsing Sanomat and other places about the current changes is it's, uh, I think, really important for people who are developing policies to ask the people who are at the coalface. Uh, those of us who are involved in doctoral education and those of us who actually are uh, training PhD students uh, to, to find out what is the thing that really works. Uh, and and I'm, I'm speaking as somebody, I, a couple of weeks ago, I think my 39th PhD student defended their PhD. Um, I've been teaching working with PhD researchers since 1998. So it's kind of one and a half, approximately one and a half PhD, PhDs per year I've been generating. And I've also been a director of a PhD program, doctoral program here at Helsinki. And not once have the people who've developed these policies asked me how I do it. Mm. And uh, it would be, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm sounding a bit sharp there. But uh, they, I think the important thing to note is that um, one of the things that we learn from research is what you learn from research is actually doing research. And it would be great if people who develop policies do the research before <laughs> developing the policies. Well, I think I'll stop there. Jaco, you had a point. <laughs> just, a, uh, just a brief comment uh, on, on the... Um, current trend towards educating more PhDs and, you know, uh, doing it in, in less amount of time. Mm. Um, those, who, those of you uh, who know me uh, uh, know what I'll, I'll say, which is I, I think this is misguided. I, uh, we, I believe we should do less and better rather than, than trying to um, spit out as many PhDs as we, as we possibly can because that is um, the training uh, somebody who actually becomes a great researcher who, who has impact in the sense that they, they um, uh, affect and change the way others think, I think is just not something that happens uh, en masse, like uh, in, in, say, a three-year period. Uh, it's it's just counter to, to what I believe um, science and, and research uh, should, should be. There is the, the argument that, okay, a PhD is just a driver's license for doing science. I, I, I do not subscribe to that, uh, to that view at all. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we'll move uh, to the Q&A. So uh, the audience in the room, you may uh, raise your hand and there's uh, Axeli over there will we'll hand you a mic. And then there's also a chat for those of you listening online. So, Jim. Jim Mitman. 
Yes, there is a mic. Oh, okay. Ah, thank you. Yeah, um, it's, it, these were excellent presentations and very stimulating. And Kaiser asked difficult questions. Uh, and at the outset, one of the questions was, well, how do you convince external parties, parties external to the university, about the impact and the worth of what we do? And I was surprised that the conversation did not go to public intellectuals. I mean, what do you do to try to produce public intellectuals? And it's striking that uh, over the course of my career, there has been a decline of public intellectuals, uh, quite a marked decline. You know, we think of a few who stand out, like Mohammed Yunus, you know, who uh, intellectual background, training, Nobel Prize winner, and then was asked to step in as the head of his government. I think of uh, Paul Krugman, who, an economist who won the Nobel Prize, and it has become a major journalist and addresses a broad public. I know that many of my uh, Finnish colleagues write for Helsing and Sanomat and so on. This, I mean, this is the, the impact, but how do we promote public scholarship? You know, and we have to learn to speak and to write in different genres. Uh, the other question comment that I'd like to hear responses to, I think was touched on, and this is the question of research and development. And it's very easy if we look at metrics because there are empirical measures that are readily available the way that uh, funding has shifted from research to development. Yeah, it's, quite out, it's out there. You, know, you can look at government funding, you can look at the philanthropies and so on, but there has been quite a shift uh, symbolized by the way that the uh, Bell Labs closed down. Bell Labs produced six Nobel Prize winners. Yeah, and so what can be done to try to reverse the shift? Thank you. Comments? Really hard. Um, the question about public intellectuals. So I suppose that also uh, that, uh, depends on the, the, the particular context we are speaking about. Some, some cultures are more amenable to, to accepting the presence of public intellectuals amongst themselves and other cultures. You, it's off with their heads in five minutes if you... Um, and, and so it, it turns into a question of how do we support such societies where the kind of service, if you want to put it in these terms, that public intellectuals to the public culture is appreciated. How do we enhance that? And that's a deeply, deeply political question. And I suppose when we watched the US elections last night, we could think about how the contending parties, what their different attitudes towards public intellectuals uh, might be. But Right. Well, yes. Um, but, but that's an extreme example um, about the... But, um, and I'm, so I have to say, I'm not so sure about public intellectuals. So I'm rather familiar with the French post-war scene. And, and that's obviously a scene where everybody is able to recognize a certain number of names who are identified as public intellectuals and who certainly themselves identify as public intellectuals. <laughs> but there are, there are all kinds of issues with that kind of a world. And, and I'm, I used to be... Uh, many years ago, I was very attached to that, and I admired that culture, and I thought, oh, if we, we only had those kinds of personalities. But now I'm, I'm much more skeptical, and I've read uh, the stuff that they write, and, and also it can be a kind of Hollywood type of life, which isn't the kind of critical consciousness raising that one expects from... I suppose, uh, public intellectuals. About the research and development question, that's a really big question, and I don't know, but maybe that's more in, in your, your line, so how to get back to research from development. The, the, the thing is that it's easy, 
everybody knows in principle that that research also in these applied fields, well, uh, fields, uh, fields that produce applications like uh, as, uh, as, as mine, um, everybody knows that that research is very, very important. But, um, and I would say that it's just easier to put more money into shorter term uh, funding and research because there at least you get you know, maybe you don't get the, the world-changing, paradigm-shifting types, uh, mm. types of results as often, but at least you get something and, you know, you can measure it. And um, I, I just believe that it's fundamentally to somebody, uh, you know, the majority of people who are, who are not in research and who do not see this from, from the inside, that uh, this, this concept of, of, you know, playing the lottery with, with bigger stakes when you don't know when the when and if the payout is going to happen, I just think that that's a fundamentally more difficult choice to make, even though I believe, and I think there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that that is where the big payoffs do come uh, in, the, in the end. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm also a bit skeptical of these days of, of what the space is for public intellectuals, and I do remember being a bit disappointed in a previous British election of one side of that debate saying who needs experts uh, in being told that the experts had said that Brexit would be terrible for the British economy and the answer from the politicians was who needs experts uh, but I, I do think that there is a there is an important space that has been lost I think that's what you're pointing towards of a uh, a space for a public debate that is a serious one where um, rather than being antagonistic, people are having critical debate, an openly critical debate in a, in a safe space. And I think um, part, possibly part of the reason that that space has narrowed so much and disappeared apart from all the social media things and so on is... Uh, in academia, a move towards what could be called a gig economy, a project-based, just looking at my colleague Andy Gran there, who's working on the concept of the project and its importance in, in, our, uh, uh, in our world, that it, you've got this re limited space of time in which you're going to do X or Y, and then, and then you can't move uh, or think beyond that, and and that I think is affecting academia quite quite seriously, not only in terms of people's careers because they're going from one gig to the next rather than having a, a permanent position, but also in the way that they imagine the breadth and the depth of what they're thinking. So thank you for the question. Yes, I think we had one here, Christine. Thank you to all. I, I'm just really moved and um, have, have, have been um, inspired to think lots of, lots of things along with you in this really wonderful panel. Um, I have um, one comment to um, Professor Koskenyemi. Um, I'm a theologian, so the question of why there is evil is, is rather, we have a simple answer. It's, it's evil. Um, I think the better question is why is there any good at all? Um, so I, I have, um, uh, I'd like to press the point about excellence, which um, seems to be such an elusive category. I mean, you referred to the French uh, professor who said, you know, je ne sais quoi, I don't know. I just I notice it when I see it. And I think that that sort of intuitive feeling um, means that we have lost probably the language to talk about excellence. And I'd like to sort of propose the language of aesthetics or beauty. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about, you know, what is um, a, an idea that is beautiful um, it, um, because you know, in philosophy, we talk about an elegant argument, a fitting argument. So these are kind of aesthetic categories. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, beauty, aesthetics, in terms of uh, why an idea w uh, would be excellent. I resonate with, uh, with that idea very much. Um, and, and so much so that I would say that uh, one of the most thrilling experiences, I, I think, that's, that, that's possible while doing research is, you know, saying out something and then 
um, the person you know you're working with, whom you 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 know admire and respect really a whole lot, um, they react to your your utterance by you know, ha, huh, that's interesting, and uh, you know that they 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 start start smiling, and you know their their eyes go someplace else, and 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 they they they, they really you can you can see that you you really got them thinking and that's that's elegance uh, that's that's beauty um on the other hand it's also incredibly el elitist in the sense that you know uh the the person has to be in exactly the right state of you know their, their expertise and their context and everything has to be eg exactly on on sort of the right place and the right level for them to be able to appreciate that 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 thought or question. So, I very much think that that's uh, this is the essence of the motivation of, of of doing research. But is that something that we can communicate, uh, you know, to the larger audience? Probably, but it's much harder. Well, in. Uh qualitative social science research, there's always been, as I said earlier, it's literature and, and how do you learn to write and is, uh, aesthetic questions, are, you bump into them constantly. But it's true that, that, uh, that, it's, that we, as you said, we lack the vocabulary a little bit. So if with a, with a researcher at the, uh, at the beginning of their research career, you start to talk about the aesthetic demands. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's received in a, in a, in a positive way. Uh, there have been uh, avant-garde types of research, especially in the 90s, um, in, in law and, and in human rights law, uh, that uh, banked quite a bit on the aesthetic aspect of what it is that uh, researchers do and the, the uh, and the outcomes that they they produce but uh, but it wasn't it was never very successful it remained in the in a bad way i would say it remained in a bad way confined in an academic world and was not received by the out, outside world as anything very serious so i i am completely with you i think it's all about aesthetics but how you speak about it and how it's uh, so it has to be somehow hidden in it. So I, I can f fully understand that in the hard sciences, in, in, in mathematics, that aesthetics plays a big role. But you can't, I suppose, talk about it in those terms very often. At some inspirational moment, you can throw in an aesthetic uh, comparison, for instance, but it can't be the core of, of what you do. And I would say the same. Uh, but the last thing I, I do is that I have always been influenced by the aesthetic appeal of older uh, researchers and or, or streams, and I've tried to. When I started out many years ago writing my first texts, I, I did that trying to ape this or trying to ape that, and trying to write like that person, and then I didn't think of it it's as much in aesthetic terms as I now think that obviously it was, and I can now pinpoint those particular qualities that existed in those texts uh, that then seemed to me uh, so appealing, and still seem. I can give a brief answer. Uh, I was sort of racking my brain uh, as you were mentioned that to think, have I, do I know of any ethnography or any anthropology that's been described as beautiful? And I can't think of one, but I, I do remember when I was reading, for reasons not going to explain now, I was reading on the history of topology. Uh, and suddenly, beauty was a huge part of it. You know, the mathematical proofs, the best mathematical proofs are beautiful. And I, I, I really, I'm still to now think, trying to think about why Anthropology is never described as beautiful. And uh, thinking about what, what that says both about both disciplines. Um, and I think uh, you could say profound, you can say inspiring, you can say uh, uh, sort of um, wonderfully written. But beauty doesn't seem to be part of it. I'm not quite, so you've given me something to think about there. 
Then I think Anne was on the line. <laughs> Thank you. That was, uh, you know, as, as um, the two first questions have said, really inspiring, really thought-provoking. And I think the questions also were thought-provoking. And what it's made me do is think about refusing the binary implied in the question that you're addressing, which is impact or insight. And the reason for that is because, as you've all addressed, we know that the driving force for research often today, academic research, is money and is, uh, is, is also promotions and the universities wanting particular ways of being seen in the world as cutting edge and so on. But at the same time, if we think about the things that have influenced all of us and affected how, how whole communities of scholarship work, it's been those things that have been insightful and have been things that have a slow burn rather than having a dramatic impact so that they then influence lots of people to do work that then might gain traction that's really very helpful. So impact comes as part of a much more extended period and the gig economy that Sarah was mentioning really goes against that very much. And also it means that if we're thinking about you know, change, we have to think about not individualizing um, the, the notion of impact into the great scholar. And I've always very much disliked the idea of the great scholar because we all build up, I'm not suggesting that I'm a great scholar, but I, I mean, <laughs> all of us, the not great and the great, build our work on what other people have done. And it means that, that often the people who are picked out as great are denying or, you know, the influence that, that's led to them producing what they are and the fact that they wouldn't be great without people um, being inspired in, in some of the ways that you've talked about. So I think that, that um, if we are to shift academic research, we have to think about new ways of understanding what scholarship is, and exactly in the ways that you've all been talking about, and new ways of understanding impact, but never separating it from the notion of insight at all. <laughs> um, maybe we will actually gather, you can comment on this, but I think I promised already one, uh, the gentleman exactly next to the mic over there. Yes, so please. Hi, thank you very much. I've got two quick questions. Um, if we think about impact um, as discussed as a form of accountability to the nation state or the modern state, um, and as the universities have a, are much older than the nation state, um, are there, we don't have to think of accountability as just bureaucratic, right? There are other kinds of accountability. What about accountability to something else other than the nation state? What role does that play for you in your work? Whether that is a group of people or something else that you work with, thinking more in medicine, for example. And then the second question is um, around understanding, um, specifically on topics that seem to be important to many students as well, and many people uh, today, at least in discourse, around how does change happen, often be the topic. Um, is it good enough to talk about understanding change? Uh, is it, is, if you wanted to understand change, should you not try and do it and therefore understand it? So, I mean, the research and development issue, if you separate them, I'm not saying that's the only way to understand it, but how, like, how do you get around that problem? Who wants to start? I, I, I would like to say first, uh, to the previous comment, um, I think that's such an important point that impact and insight go together, and the fact that that should even have to be said, uh, points to somewhere where we are at the moment. So that was a great comment, thank you. And the um, other comment behind which 
also points to a really important point. I mean, you're asking about activism and, and how we use our academic work to be active. And it does sound again from the results yesterday that some of us are going to have to be a bit more active than we have been thus far. Um, the, the question of impact does point towards or away from precisely that kind of activism, I think, that being required to have impact of a particular kind does pull away from the other kind of active impact you might want to have with your work. And uh, so it's a, it's a very important point to make. I mean, I think it was uh, I.L. Weissman who pointed out that the uh, Israeli Defense Force had used a thousand plateaus, the ideas of a thousand plateaus, to develop their perimeter fence around uh, Gaza and the West Bank. I'm sure that Deleuze and Guattari wouldn't have appreciated or uh, approved of that particular impact of their work. Um, so you can't always detect or know what the impact is, but I think the point that uh, the impact is not necessarily being driven by us and what we might wish is a, is a very important one to make, so thank you. I want to hook on to the second part of the question first, the, the question as to whether understanding is enough, or certainly it isn't enough. When I earlier on and made this distinction between problem solving and understanding, and I said, well, universities are about understanding, not problem solving. It, that does have a link to, to the social problems, the pressing social and other problems that we have, te technological, economic, etc., that we have. Namely, in the sense that universities train experts. And experts decide on those problems. Experts are there in the problem solving. Now, if universities send people as problem solvers out there, you want them to be people of understanding. And that understanding includes their own self-positioning in that decisionistic moment, when within their expertise, in all the fields of expertise that I know of, they choose between the alternative ways to go about it, because no expertise operates automatically as an algorithm where the expert merely speaks the mouth of some knowledge. The expert is always in a decisionistic mo uh, moment, and because that is so, it's so important that the expert is a human being of understanding. So that's, so that's where understanding and, and uh, uh, social decision-making go together. Then you ask the uh, slightly surprising but, but, but uh, important question about accountability. So who, to whom are we accountable? And it's true that the university and the nation state, in Finland especially, but in many more countries, have kind of walked hand in hand. Nationalism, the idea of the Finnish nation, um, etc. My grandfather was a professor at the university, was a rector of the University of Turku and was a poet and a great nationalist and he thought always that, that these things could, went together in some uh, mysterious way. But I, and that was the 1920s ethos and 1930s ethos. I think that's gone. And I don't know about, about colleagues, but I never felt that the nation state is some entity to which I should uh, pay homage to or feel accountable to. I think the nation state is part of the injustice of the world, which is part of the problems that I am <laughs> trying to cope with. And the sooner we get rid of that, the better, although it doesn't seem that it's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> Um, but um, but that does, so the, the the issue of accountability. So uh, uh, I think uh, Sarah pointed out. So we are people of of privilege, and and we travel to places, and we meet with brilliant people, and it's a really interesting career that we've had. Surely there must be a sense that one is accountable to somebody and that one's work is meaningful and that it deals with uh, some aspect of the world that makes it possible for us to be in those privileged uh, positions. But it has nothing to do with nation states or a specific institution. One last thing I want to say, I'm bored with the university. 
I'm bored with the German idea of the research university. I am. I think it's so. We should let out of that. I. I am. Uh, I feel uneasy when the you know, has University of Helsinki has started this alumni ethos, and we should all kind of put the the, the flame in our powerpoints and and all that utter nonsense. Uh, uh, so I. Uh, I'm in the w in the service of something way larger, and the, the university has been sometimes an obstacle, sometimes slightly helpful, more an obstacle side. But but uh, <laughs> and and I want to my researchers to have that sense too that they are part of some larger thing in which they together um, form a community, and that may be linked to whatever nation-state institution or commercial institution or governmental institution, if that's necessary. But that's not the, the, uh, the point of final responsibility. It's, I, I, I'm a person, as you already noticed, of great words. So humankind might be a, a, a word to throw in at this point. Any comments? What can I say? I wholeheartedly agree with, uh, with, with Marti. The, um, the, um, maybe uh, one, one thing, you know, we are being funded by, by, by taxpayers. Um, we do have, I, in my view, we do have, um, um, there's a reason why the, the state upholds the university. And, you know, there are expectations. We haven't talked about much about those expectations on this panel, and we don't have time to do so uh, very much. But at least we are paying rent, so to speak, in training people to be those experts who go out and have the expert opinion on things. Because I, I say maybe once every, every lecture, when, when, when my students ask a question, and, you know, I tell them, the answer, like always, is it depends. And you, <laughs> you need to know what the context is and you know, what it depends on and what to do in, in, in certain kinds of situations. And we need those people to go out there and, and, and solve the problems. Just to be fair to the online audience, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. I think maybe uh, one more question. So please, over here. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful, open, and uh, free discussion. Um, what I'm concerned about is the kind of research that takes place behind closed doors, closed research for the state, surveillance for intelligence, for military purposes. As you mentioned you know, in the case, this, this is also an impact. So is it not necessary for students not to be trained, but to be educated in ethics, first and foremost? What is the purpose of research if it is, if it is not measured in, um, in, through ethical criteria as well? Well, ethics is an official part of um, uh, of training of researchers and PhD researchers. Uh, uh, I have because I haven't gone through that. Uh, I have little knowledge about how efficient or how what the response on researchers on the on the side of young researchers is to the to the perhaps rather minimal but nevertheless existing ethical research that is there. Um, whether that, that ethical training involves questions about, um, about transparency, about openness of research, I'm not so sure because there are so many research institutions and situations where the research cannot be completely open. And uh, uh, in, in medical science, the issues where patents are being produced um, and then, obviously, for the state, as you mentioned, so security-related uh, research, it cannot be open in the sense that the uh, criminology research <laughs> can be and should be open. Uh, but it should have its own rules, and there should be ways of, of judging the appropriateness of research also done behind closed doors. But 
uh, it may be obvious that so I was trained in, in foreign ministry, so I was trained as a diplomat, so I have more sympathy towards, um, uh, towards non-transparency than many of my colleagues would have. I think there are situations where you cannot and should not publish research in the way that you publish uh, normally uh, university research, but colleagues may have different views. Yeah, I mean, it, this is a huge issue in anthropology, obviously, and has been for the whole history of the discipline. Um, and we have had many debates, even in recent years, about what could be called embedded anthropology, uh, particularly in relation to the US military in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. Uh, and actually those people have, those units have struggled to find experts in those areas to work with the military because of, because of these ethical issues. I think um, some of the ways in which ethics has been discussed has been overtaken by concern about lawsuits and about appearances. I, I mean, anthropology often struggles with uh, the ethical regulations for a particular research project um, because the ethics are written mostly for medical research and not for anthropological research and uh, fitting the ethics in to a situation where people are living 24-7 with the people they're, they're, who are participating in their research is a very difficult thing so quite often the ethical regulations are both too little and too much for the kinds of research that we do, which goes back to the question of um, uh, making the standards and the regulations fit the different disciplines as appropriate. Um, I, I, it's a very difficult problem that I, I recognize that Marti has mentioned here, that there are times when maybe you can justify not speaking out, but there are also occasions when that idea is covering up stuff that really should be made public and I'm not quite sure I know how to resolve that. Do you have any comments? Um, yeah. Just just saying that uh, or echoing what uh, what Marty was saying earlier that that ethics and ethical training is a central part of, of researcher training and that is something that we are experiencing for good reason uh, in uh, particularly in, in our work on machine learning and artificial artificial intelligence these days. The, um, the foremost publications in the field have for a couple of years, for instance, uh, mandated that ev the, every accepted paper has to have a, um, a section on potential negative societal implications and force, force the authors to think about you know, the longer term perspectives and potential applications of, of their work. Of course, that's, that's a very, often a very difficult um, exercise in the sense that most often you're solving or, you know, improving one uh, well-known, an aspect of a well-known problem and you're making it better in, 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 some, in some ways and the applications are really far away um, and, the, uh, and, and these potential implications have more to do with the... Um, with the field as, uh, as a whole, rather than the particular piece of work that you, um, the, or the particular advance that you present uh, in that work. So it's, it's complicated, but it is also something that is, uh, is being increasingly incorporated into the publication process itself. Okay. Uh, I thank you, uh, dear panelists and, and the audience here and online for an excellent discussion. And we can maybe linger here a bit longer and continue. Uh, I also want to mention that if you are free tomorrow, there's uh, a seminar on academic freedom at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies where we continue this conversation in some way. We have our honorary fellow, James Middleman, giving a keynote and then three fellows, current fellows of the Collegium. One of them was actually mentioned, and Andrew Gron. Uh, who, whose project on projects was mentioned by Sarah. He will give a talk about that. And then also to other fellows, Tim Stuart Battle and Jitka Stolova. So please join us tomorrow at 11. Thank you. <laughs>